Okay, let's start. Uh, with the slides. So last, uh, as we discussed in the last uh, Thursday, after the basic concepts of uh, uh, statistics, uh, how to do different type of tests and all those things. So we decided we will continue that with data visualization, which is an extremely important part of data presentation. And this is how the scheme would go for this one. I think we will have to postpone the 23rd November presentation because there is a surgery meeting. So maybe we'll do that on 30th. And uh, so basically today we'll be talking on uh, data visualization. So uh, you had learned how to make the Excel sheet, how to clean it up and how to uh, make it analyzable. And then you had talked from our statisticians, what test to use uh, under what situation you had learned about meta-analysis. So today we'll be uh, briefly talking on how to visualize the data there are many many tools which is not possible to be covered in one talk so this is more of an overview and in the next uh, uh, lecture subsequently you'll be seeing live demo and you can bring your laptops i'll share the database and also give a link to some softwares and you can try doing those and create uh, beautiful looking graphics okay uh, so let's begin with a clinical research or clinical study scenario this is a real study that actually we had done i'm just showing a part of it so the study population is patient having chronic pancreatitis with severe recurrent pain and depression and the intervention was um, disease related education to teach the patient about cp and see if they improve in different parameters like pain parameter or cognitive psychological depression parameters uh, the groups like it, it was a pre post design so each group had 64 patients and the parameter that i'm taking today for uh, this presentation is the emotional score of the patient has there been any improvement in emotional score so so any any out idea how we should present the data on emotional score patient we, we did, uh, looked at the urtc there is an emotion parameter so it's given by a number like 5 10 20 30 100 so how will you present that emotional score? One we can do as a table, but can we make it more attractive? I think all of you should participate. I'll be asking questions today, lots of questions. So one is table, right? It just started actually. Uh, table may not look attractive. There will be a few numbers. What else? Can we present it as some kind of a diagram? Some kind of a bar because or some kind of a circle or square usually it can be done as a bar diagram right so i'm giving you four examples of bar diagram so you have to select one of these for your paper so which one will you select there are four there any anyone can participate anyone can comment or volunteer the manasa was the first one why Labeling is there and anyone else, any other choice? Second one, why? Error bars are there, but it doesn't look as good as the first one, right? So who will use none of this? I will probably use none of this. Why will come later? So we'll again come back to this towards the end of the talk. So basically there are lots of visualization tools and modes how you can present your data. One you just saw is a bar diagram. You can have box and whisker plot, violin plots, line diagrams, scatter plots, several of them. And uh, the uh, red ones usually are used to depict numerical data. The blue ones usually are used to show proportions, percentages. And these uh, green ones, you can show all type of both numerical and proportion based data, right? And there are many more. So, I mean, uh, if you go through the net or read literature, you'll let see more. So, basically, what is the science and art? So, whenever we present any kind of figures, there has to be two important components. One is, the, of course, the science part, whatever you present, the mean, median, mode, or uh, percentages, whatever you do. So, it should be created in such a way that it gives you the maximum possible information. 
even without going to the text just by looking at the diagram you should be able to know that yes but these are the different types of things that has been shown in the diagram yet it should not be cluttered it should be easy to easy to understand and the uh, uh, the legend figure legend what what you write below the figure should be very clear it should contain little bit of the method the sample size all those things should be there so that is the science part of it so what is the art part of it it should look visually appealing so if you see in so here the most visually appealing is probably the fourth one wonderful the first one has some scientific elements but it do not have the error bars the standard deviation is not there so even though it looks good it is not giving me the right kind of or complete scientific information so neither of them are ideal for presentation right so and uh, aesthetics means the color should be good it should not be too glaring and there should not be unnecessary things for example here if you see in the first even though it has the data it has vertical or uh, horizontal lines those lines are not needed they create unnecessary uh, disturbance to the visual thing so those lines should not be so those are unnecessary uh, things which should not be there right so that is the science part of it sorry the art part of it so and uh, of course the labeling should be clear well i can come to this again repeatedly with each diagram so now let, tell me how do you present proportions proportions with percentage like 10 percent of this 20 percent of that how do you present those kind of data proportions very simple all of you have used it repeatedly so pie chart very good so again pie chart when you do a pie chart again the important scientific contents of course there has to be the labels has to be there the exact number has to be there and the percentage so pie chart will always tell you part of the whole like all these are discrete components so if a component is discrete then only you can use a pie chart if it has said uh, if it falls into two categories you cannot use a pie chart pie chart has to be only in one category you add data which should be 100 right so you have to uh, write the name of the category the number and the percentage and aesthetics means you can make it a 3d you can make it a 2d color should be contrasting so that is the aesthetic part so how to present proportions within proportions hmm, tricky again pie chart so here again this is some of about so most of the things that i'm showing are already published data from our work uh, so so this is again a published paper where the the patients were divided into depression no depression so there cannot be any overlap no depression depression a discrete group so they fit for a pie chart and then within depression what are the severity of depression mild moderate severe so they can again this this is a component pie chart so from this category you can make another pie chart depicting the different components right so uh, that is how it is done now again can you tell me any other method of presenting proportions within proportions like say for example what do you mean by proportion within proportion 50 percent of patients uh, have a very high bmi out of that like 20 percent are male uh, then uh, 80 percent are female then out of that 80 percent female say 30 percent are in the age group of 70 to 80 years so that is proportion within proportion how can you present that or is that at all presentable yeah exactly so till, till few years back these things are unknown of but with the development of computational technology you can uh, present this in different beautifully so this is an example of a sunburst radial sunburst plot right? so for example i don't know if you can see from the end so there are three groups like no diabetes pre-diabetes and diabetes again this is a published paper from our dn one of our uh, dnb students and in the no uh, and for each group again we can divide it into male and female so if you see m and f the green ones are no diabetes again among the male and female how many had severe acute pancreatitis mild acute pancreatitis or moderately severe acute pancreatitis again among the moderately severe and severe you can divide into the proportion of necrosis more than 30 percent less than 30 percent so you can keep on increasing this until it looks very cluttered and thing so this is one way of presenting proportions within proportions another way is again this is a hierarchical uh, sun uh, plot so again here if you see uh, the basic groups will be depression no depression mild depression moderate depression and again within those depression category how many had pain 
you can again increase this by putting number of males or females, whatever the data requires or what or the way you want to present your result. Again, in no, no pain, you can in, add another layer, being how many male patient, how many female patient, whether the different age group or what is the BMI, whatever uh, the data demands. So that way you can put many parameters within the same diagram. So just by looking at the diagram, you know several things. You don't have to read the text, right? So that is important. Now, how do you uh, present relationship between two numerical variables? This is easy here. All of you know it. Yeah? Scatter plot. Okay. So this is the simple, simplest possible scatter plot. And what does all this dot mean? Yeah? Louder, I, I am getting old, I can hear. Each, it indicates each patient, right? So here the scatter plot shows the relationship between plasma, endotoxin and fasting blood glucose, again one from our published paper. So for example, let's take this point here. So in this patient, uh, the plasma endotoxin is around here, so say 0.9 or 8. And then the fasting blood glucose is around what would be, I mean, 170, 180. So like that, each patient's point, two parameters are plot here, plotted here. And then you can draw this trend line. So this is basically how you uh, present the relationship between two numerical variables. And again, um, aesthetics, if you see here, uh, the font size should be legible. It should be big enough. This line should be clear enough. The scientific part here should be, the labeling should be very clear. Many times you might see only fasting blood because the unit is not written. That is wrong. The unit has to be written there. Again, plasma endotoxin level, the units have to be written. So that is the scientific content. And most importantly, in any scatter plot, you have to put the R value. If you don't put the P value, that's fine. P value is one of the most or least important things in statistics. And uh, in scatter plot, the R value is much more important, right? So you have to put the R value here. Can we improve it now? Is there a scope of improvement here? So this is showing a nice scatter. There is a very significant p-value. Our, our value is very good. Anything above 8 or 7 is good. So the correlation coefficient is good. Uh, the graph looks okay. I mean, labelings are fine. You have the labels. The numbers are clear. The axes are clear. Can we improve it? What is missing here? something very important so so can we apply this graph to the whole population this is a small population study patients who presented to AIG can we extrapolate it to the whole state of Telangana or maybe whole of India yes or no say something no okay the answer is no why to extrapolate a data set or a result to a larger population, what is the most important component or parameter? Hmm? Number, okay. If the numbers are low, what is 95% confidence interval? So it's very important to have 90. The 95% confidence interval tells us that if we do the same test in 100 population, 100 different population group, 95 times the results will be in that range. So we can be sure that, okay, 95% sure, okay, these patients uh, mostly can be applied to a bigger population. And that is how you put a 95% confidence interval here, right? And then also here, if you notice, uh, these are the same patients who has chronic pancreatitis, but some of them have diabetes, some do not have diabetes. So from these dots, we do not know which are the patient who had diabetes who did not have diabetes. So you can also color code them. So here, if you see, this is from another paper, if you see the controls, he's been given a different color, infected pancreatic necrosis, a different color, and no infected pancreatic necrosis, a different color. And then you have this 95% confidence interval uh, range. So so this, this is kind of, a, so here, what is missing here? Is anything missing here? R value, yes. So, so this is uh, near perfect, not perfect, because R value is not here. So had the R value been here, it would have been a complete, it would have described the whole data set completely. 
and it could also be extra so the narrower the 95 percent confidence interval the more it can be applied to the entire population or a larger population uh, of patients if it is wider then this applicability in the general population or bigger population becomes less and less so wherever possible it's always important to at the 95 percent even in tables you can do that like uh, with a mean or with a median with any kind of parameters even with percentage you can put 95 percent confidence interval which is very important so what does this tell now we had discussed about um, scatter plots 95 percent and all those things so what does this imp imply here again this is basically a scatter plot with uh, which uh, correlates we see the correlation between the back depression score and a uh, quality of life parameter but here if you see there are different circles of different sizes and colors so here we have another component of pain right so this is the scale of pain so if you here see here this patient who has a very uh, like uh, color is at the end of the spectrum so he the pain score of this patient on the visual analog scale is 10 so if you see the color gradient from red to blue indicates pain and uh, the severity of pain and that is also added by the size of the so if you see all the blues uh, or things will be purple and all the red dots or circles will be very small so lesser severity of pain has a smaller size of the circle and red color so this is another thing that you can incorporate in your and these are all clinical data so I'm not showing any data on basic sciences. These are all clinical, which most of you are doing. So this is another nice way of presenting the data where you can incorporate two, three different components, right? Uh, so let's make it a little more interesting and complex. So here again, what we look to us, uh, there is a metabolite called N-acetyl aspartate in the brain. So in the patients who had chronic pancreatitis and depression, we try to look at the left hippocampus and acetyl aspartate and how it correlates to the emotional function of the patient, right? So here again, basically these uh, these are the simple correlations. But what we added here was, if you see the uh, color of the circles indicates the degree of depression. So all the yellow circles indicate mild depression. All the green circles indicate severe depression. And then we also added pain. The size of the circle indicates pain. Right. So what this tells it this not only tells about the correlation between the left hippocampus and acetyl aspartate and emotional function, it also brings in the parameters of the severity of depression and the severity of pain. So it, here we can uh, analyze four kind of parameters, even though the simple scatter plot tells us two parameters. Right. So this is another way of presenting like multi-parameter correlation. So that will give you a better idea of the patients and each line indicates the uh, trend line for each depression groups. Okay. And this is another way of presenting again. Uh, this is from one of our microbiome paper. Again, what you saw here was there were two axes, right? Basically, there were two parameters here also two, here also two. And we added the other in form of colors or size of the circles or uh, there are different ways to do also but here what you see this is called a who, who can name this the microbiome researcher will be able to correlogram so this is called a correlogram like here we are not looking correlation between only two parameters right so suppose we have seen correlation between this how many bacteroid it is are present and how many enterococci are present in a particular patient or a group of patients so that would have been a correlation between this and this and here we could have plotted a simple kind of scatter plot with a line but here we are trying to see the correlation between the bacteroids and all these organisms enterococcus and all these organisms so if you see here all these are deep blue because uh, bacteroids and bacteria will be a correlation of one right so so this is this is the strongest correlation so this is expected to be blue Blue means here a strong this uh, correlation. This is the uh, scale bar, and minus one is the maximum negative correlation. Plus one is the maximum positive correlation. Now, if you see here, it's very dark. So Enterococcus and Roseburia are negatively correlated, which means that if Enterococcus is high, then the good bacteria ro uh, Roseburia comes down. At the same time, we can also see Enterococcus and uh, Eubacterium. So in the conventional para, uh, correlation, we cannot do this multi-parameter. 
So here we can see, and this can also be done in other clinical parameters like depression, different category of depression and different the cytokine levels or different de degree of uh, socioeconomic status with uh, uh, different degree of uh, or different numbers of uh, income. So all those clinical things can also be put into a correlogram. Okay. Uh, time course data. What is a time course data? Basic scientists are more fond of that. They will do experiments and every one hour they will see. So time course, what is a time course? So it's a continuation of events over time, right? So what kind of diagram would be best for time course data? Anyone? Suppose, suppose uh, on 1st of January something happened. And the same thing we are repeating on 1st of March, same thing we are repeating on 1st of June. So what kind of, uh, say say the uh, patient inflow at AIG on 1st January, on 1st April, on 1st June, 1st October. It may increase, it may decrease because of various reasons, right? So how to express that data? So that is a time, time course. Hmm? Simple, it's one of the most simple diagram called the line diagram. So here, here, this is from one of our Again, um, basic science, but it, it, it implies the same thing. So here, if we see here, what we did was we looked at cytokines at different time point, but you can change this, uh, just now, whatever I said, number of patients visiting AIG, and it, this can be the dates for January, for March, for So, so uh, here you can express it as the uh, time course. So at each point, at one hour, the cytokine was this much, at three hour, this much, and you can join these points. This is line diagram because these are not isolated events. If it is an isolated event, suppose uh, what happens here and what happens here, nothing happens in between. If it is if it is an isolated event, then line diagram is not the right thing because cytokine secretion from somewhere or patient coming to AIG is a continuous event. Every day patient will come. Right? But suppose uh, at zero hour this was the cytokine and nothing happens in between. At one hour we did some experiment. This is the cytokine. Then it would be. Then what kind of diagram would that be? If it is not a continuous event, if it is happening independently at this time time points, what kind of graph would it be? Bar diagram, because these are independent events at independent time points. But here it's a continuous, we cannot measure the cytokines at all time points, every second, right? So we choose time points. We cannot maybe uh, difficult to measure amount of patient coming to AIG on every hourly basis, right? So we'll select some points and what happens in between can be presume that okay this would be the curve or this would be the pattern of cytokine here or this would be the pattern of patient coming to between those two points so for this kind of data line diagram is the best okay uh, proportions with different outcomes okay let me explain this first uh, suppose uh, we are trying to look at uh, how many uh, we take a group of male individuals female individuals and then follow them up for some time and some of them will become obese some do not become obese some of the male become obese some of the male female become obese and some of the male and female do not become obese so so that is proportions with different outcomes so what kind of graph uh, would suit this kind of a data maybe difficult not not so common so that is called a sankey plot Right. So you may be seeing this in newer papers, not, the, not in the older papers. This is a very new. I think Nitin had used in one of our papers, which is under review at, at this point. So here, uh, for example, so this is one of the most simplest, but you can keep on adding layers. The way I showed for the sunburst plot, you can keep on adding layers. Right. So, uh, so these are the uh, unmarried people. These are the married people. And uh, so, the, uh, so this proportion of unmarried, of married people had a pet. And those married people have, and these are the proportion of patients who are happy. So you can you can break down the uh, proportion into smaller groups. Right? So this is just an example I picked up from the net. Uh, I think the link is down here. But you can apply this to your clinical thing. So it, it shows very nicely what outcome, which proportion of patient end up in what outcome. So this is uh, called the Sankey plot. Uh, proportion within proportions within individuals. How do you measure proportion within one individual or one group? Again, this is kind of little more 
uh, lean towards microbiome or metabolome research so you'll be able to say so how, how do you do that what are these looks complex but uh, if you see clearly a bit so what are these called stack bar so again stack bar is something like a uh, pie chart pie chart also you would tell, tell different type of depression mild moderate severe and they would add up to be, become 100 right so here if you see the x-axis all those are individual patients so in pie chart you cannot do this in individual patients it's always a group or a proportion among the whole group right here uh, each each uh, bar so these are all bar chart you can separate them also if you separate them you'll see separate bars and each color indicates one bacteria the proportion of that bacteria within that individual right so it has to be 100 the, if you add up all these different bacteria you can see the color codes here it has to be 100 so it's called a relative abundance so abundance of a particular or a, a proportion of a particular organism within that individual's whole organism uh, list right so these are called stack powers and this indicates the individual uh, healthy control then type 1 diabetes type 2 type 3 and if you take the means of all this of the different groups then you can present is that individual stack bars based on the whole group so this is the mean uh, or the median whatever uh, you want to take of the healthy individual then uh, type di cp with diabetes cp without diabetes so so this is how you present the proportions within individual groups uh, okay efficacy at the individual level do we have any oncologist here this is uh, so how, how, how yeah he's right there he'll tell us so this is very popular among onco on oncology literature every on cancer papers will have that waterfall plot yes so waterfall plot what do you do so this is of course not a cancer thing uh, basically uh, here uh, this study evaluated some medication of different doses again this is from the net not our study and here you can uh, whatever outcome you want for example say the tumor size from baseline how much the tumor size has increased or decreased or here the study was on hemoglobin so uh, so this was the baseline so from baseline after giving the treatment how many patients had an increase in hemoglobin and how much increase right so all these again uh, are individual uh, individual patients each bar indicates individual patients so in the first patient the hemoglobin increase was by four say and then accordingly and some patients uh, this clinical trials may not necessarily increase the hemoglobin in all patients so in this last few patients uh, those coming down those are the patient actually your hemoglobin had come down after uh, giving the treatment and that happened best with this uh, the first dose of uh, 1500 i think yeah now all this can also be merged into one 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 diagram so this is a waterfall plot it's just like a waterfall coming from up to down so the same thing you can merge the data so this is again from some cancer paper uh, uh, so yeah so here if you see again the same concept the tumor size after using a certain chemotherapy the tumor size has come down by this percentage these are the percentage in the individual patients so the uh, drugs appear to be working well and in a small number of patients only four patients there was actually an increase and you can actually divide these into different categories based on disease progression just you have to change the color code each color code will give you the individual group right so this is the waterfall plot and this can also be applied in the other non-cancer related um, efficacy studies or outcome studies for example depression if you uh, give the counseling to a patient how much change in the depression score has happened compared to baseline so that itself can lead to a waterfall plot and this is a good way of presenting because you are seeing the individual not the mean or median some mean medians may sometimes be misleading your mean may be very good but the, the, the dispersion may be very high. i will come to that which may actually not make it significant mean wise it may look significant but if you look at the standard deviation or interquartile range then it do not become significant so that's why this is a very intelligent way of putting the data where you see the data change of each individual patient okay so then pooled okay i already showed the picture pool data from different studies you had heard last time i think meta-analysis so uh, this is what what is this plot called everyone forest plot yeah so uh, 
when you do a forest plot, few things are very important. If at all you do some meta analysis in future, few things has to come in the forest plot. One, of course, this will be there. Uh, the treatment, how many patients got treatment and how many were placebo, the study groups, the year, the difference which is called standard mean difference, but few things, the heterogeneity should come in this because most of the meta-analysis shows the heterogeneity or the homogeneity in studies and there is something called a tau value and uh, so all these things should, an I square value, it should come here and higher the I square means the studies are more and more heterogeneous. So this is one instance where P value of less than 0 0.5 is something we do not want. So usually what we say P value is like less than 0 0.2 is 0 0.5 is very significant and 0 0.005 even more significant. But when we talk about the heterogeneity, the I square value, the higher the I square value means the studies are more heterogeneous. So the results need to be uh, interpreted with caution. They may not tell us the accurate result, right? So here the p-value should be more than 0 0.05. That is what we want in a meta-analysis to look when we look at the heterogeneity, right? So so the, again um, here in meta-analysis we can see two type present two types of data. One this is the pain score. So this is again from one of our studies, the pain score. So how much pain score reduction has happened with the use of antioxidant? So this is the meta-analysis all about, right? So here if you see that these are the difference of pain score. So pain score is a continuous variable. So if it is a continuous variable, you will see it in terms of means. So this is called the standard difference in means. The mean score difference in each individual study. Right. So, so here if you see, you will see uh, the difference from 0 to 2 to 4 and like that. And based on that, you will get these uh, boxes. These are the effect sizes. How powerful is the effect? So uh, here is the Again, you can put it in numbers, it's optional, mm, it's a relative weight. So all these studies have a similar relative weight. So if the studies have a similar relative weight, then it may be uh, considered like equivalent in quality. But again, if you see some of these uh, dots are in the zero level, zero level means it's not working. So that's where the heterogeneity comes in, heterogeneity comes in. So, uh, so this is important. What are these lines? Can anyone tell? Uh, so th this is the effect size, the uh, how much uh, effect uh, this has been quantified. But what is this number, this line? 95% hmm? confidence interval. So so if the confidence interval crosses the zero line, zero means no effect, either this way, that way. So uh, half of this is here, but the one, one part of the line is on the favors placebo. So this is a not effective treatment. This is the effective treatment. So this is the best effective treatment because this is the line of um, so uh, efficacy. So if everything is on the left towards antioxidants, so that is the uh, best study of all these, right? Then the other way or other parameter that can be presented in a uh, meta-analysis or a forest plot is odds ratio. So here the events are not in numbers uh, or, or, or the parameters are not in numbers. Here it's events like some side effect happening or some bleeding happening in one treatment group, no bleeding or bleeding in the placebo group. So these are called the events. So here I don't know, I, I, I can pick this up from uh, the net. So I don't know what is this study, but uh, this is the treatment group. This is the placebo group. So in the treatment group, 25 events happened, whatever outcome they had measured out of 37. And here is 14. So here the results are expressed as odds ratio. So if there is an odds ratio, odds ratio cannot be zero. Odds ratio is uh, one, one odds ratio means there is no effect uh, either way. So, uh, so this is the other way how you can or you can make it a relative risk or you can make it a risk ratio. So this is proportion. The, the earlier forest plot was showing continuous data and this is a proportion data, non, uh, like a proportion, uh, I mean non-continuous variable. So these are again, we have to keep all this here. Right. So that, that's about uh, pool data, meta-analysis and thing. Time-based event. So how, how do we express this? So the, the earlier one that I showed was time course. Everything was happening continuously, but we are just picking up some time points. This is time based event. Suppose you are again, this is uh, very popular in cancer studies. 
Kaplan Mayer. So you presented us, but but uh, we can use it in anything. This is one of our paper on diabetes and chronic pancreatitis. So again, uh, the important components, the, 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 the y-axis should indicate at the beginning of the treatment. So all patients, none of the patients had diabetes or for example in cancer papers at the beginning of the study at zero time point, none of the patients will die for example, right? But as the treatment goes on uh, with time, so there will be some uh, death here. So this is called an event. Now in this red bar where, where ductal clearance some ERCP was done after that, these were the patients who were not having diabetes. Then again, suddenly here there were diabetes was detected. So these are events that are happening at different time points. So we don't, so these are not continuous events, but uh, events happening at different time points. And that is why in these kind of studies, we follow the patient for a certain duration. It may in basic science also, uh, this kind of uh, studies are done where the animals are followed for a short duration, weeks or maximum months. But in clinical, we can, depending upon what kind of study, short duration study for six months, uh, long duration study for many years. And with each uh, time point, what events happen is shown here. So one, when it comes down, that means some event has happened, right? So that is, that is what is shown. And then what does this mean? This is very important. If you ever do any kaplan mayer always make sure to put this numbers this number will keep on decreasing with the time with each time point so that will also give you this gives you a visual representation okay this is how the graphs are uh, coming down this is the difference but this will also give you the absolute numerical data or, uh, so you can also know the numbers exact numbers and this can be compared by several tests depending on the most common is the log rank test which will give you the p-value and so 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 this kind of uh, time-based events are expressed as uh, the same, uh, the kaplan mayer curve. So again, here if you see, uh, these are the axis, the labels are legible. It's clear what is this, it could be month, it could be days, here it is years. This is the proportion, that means percentage of patients. You know the red and green line, what they indicate. You know the p-value, you know the... So this, this contains all the essential elements that you are supposed to know from a so if you see this you need not read the text from here itself you can say okay this is how it is going and patients who underwent ductal clearance had diabetes at a later time point right? so that, that is what the study was about okay so again coming back to the first where we were talking about aesthetics i think i have three four more slides so now since we had gone through all these we have understood about the aesthetics the scientific content and here we have, I, I told I would not use any of these and some one of you wanted to use this one because there were data then Vijay wanted to use this one because there was standard bar but none of them are the perfect thing which have all the elements how about this one like same 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 data set same graph right but here if you see you have these labels here you have this uh, bars here you have the error bars you have the numbers here this is the x-axis y-axis and it gives you the score and the unit it is a mean and standard deviation right is there anything missing here statistical very good we can put a p-value here anything else what what you can't say from this figure yeah was that title that's okay okay i take it title fine you can put it in the legend so in any study more the number of patients the results are more and more reliable so from this graph can you say the sample size no so that is missing so you can put the sample size here right if you have the sample size and a p-value on top it completes it you have uh, the mean you have the standard deviation you have the groups you have the sample size you have the error bars you have the exact number but still is it so so it tells us these parameters the central tendency the dispersion means the standard deviation or interquartile range the labeling is very labeling is very detailed the values actual value so here you don't know the actual value here you have written the actual value so uh, what is here is here you see this uh, sample size and there is some aesthetic quality it looks like not very ugly it looks appealing to the eyes kind of right 
again beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder someone of him may not like we get up it says but does it tell everything do we want to know something more on this data set these are all continuous variables remember these are numbers individual patients emotional score we calculated so what we don't know from here so so first of all let's let's go a little bit in the basics how are these generated so so how are these generated so if we plot these patients this is the the score from 0 to 100 0 to 100 this is the pre education group this is the post education group so what happens most of the patients will have the mean is calculated or median is calculated from all these values right so if you go towards so here the mean was 45 right rounded up 45 so maximum number of patients values are here right and as you go away the number of patients values are coming are lesser and lesser so this is called the central tendency so whenever you calculate the mean all the other patients if they are near the mean so that is towards like like group going to the center so there is a increasing central tendency same thing is happening here and based on that we get a mean of 58 or if you want to do median it will be a little different now what determines this significance statistical significance between these like whenever you write a table for example the mean is this much in one group this much in the other group and the p-value is point whatever so what 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 actually determines that significance is it the mean or something else am i asking a tough question i don't think normality okay that's so okay you are i mean going in that direction uh, so let's merge both of these right so what happens now so so our our p value was based on so this was based on here the, this this is the mean value right now if we see here as these numbers are coming closer to the mean we call it a central tendency as it goes away we call it the dispersion right so when we are merging this there is a common group here so these these are the patients purely in the post education group these are the patients purely in the pre education group here is there is a merging like in this area both pre and post education patients are there so by looking at this can we say so 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 if i ask you uh, this uh, green green uh, patient so this is the post education so he got the education about the chronic pancreatitis and his depression score is supposed to be improving but if i take out this particular patient for example can you see yeah so if i ask you is education helping him or not can you say yes or no is it actually helping him we don't know because he's within the within the dispersion of also pre-education or no education group right so in these group in none of the patient we can actually say if the intervention had helped him or not right so even if the p this mean looks different or mean looks impressive it actually may not be statistically significant because there is lots of overlap so the dispersion is overlapping now if the dispersion becomes less and less so if this 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 uh, this goes more towards this side this comes more towards this side so the overlapping area will come down so the dispersion if the dispersion of the data is less then this overlapping will come down and that is what as uh, arif told the distribution so if the distribution is normal and is very narrow then the dispersion is less the standard deviation or the interquartile range will be less and that is what determines the significance not the absolute p-value i mean absolute mean or median so that is the importance of thing but now uh, there there are i mean th this is just a made up diagram this do not have 64 i just made up to explain this concept uh, but then we don't know where this patient lies for example take this patient and i ask you where in this whole diagram this patient lies can anyone say no Similarly, we cannot say where this patient lies in the green, right? Uh, so the overlapping patients may be this. These, these may be the overlapping. If you draw a line here and draw a line here, so these will be the overlapping patients, right? So this will be maybe both in the red and green, but we don't know exactly which patient is where, right? So basically, even though this diagram looks very nice, attractive, it has all the uh, possible parameters, including this p-value here. 
it do not tell us about the median and the interquartile range it do not tell us about the individual patient's position in that diagram so here there is an outlier it's very very different very far off thing this outlier this do not tell us right and it do not tell us about the distribution is it a normal distribution or non normal distribution so how to incorporate all these things in this one box plots right so that is the basic concept of a box and whisker plot so this is the box and whisker plot on the same data if you see here uh, the pre post education uh, this is the median these are the interquartile range median interquartile and so you can also add a line or put a mark for the mean that, that can be done if you put the code uh, in the software uh, so what is the, what this does not come and it gives you the uh, outlier here right so what is missing here can we improve it huh yeah we can pair so that is called a zitter or i mean these, these are just so but if you look at this one we'll come to this later on if so here you can get an idea of the distribution can you get an idea of the distribution is it so is the data normally distributed or non normally distributed so, so what is the normal distribution in normal distribution it should be like a perfect bell shaped curve if it is going this way or if the peak is this way that is a non normal which we cannot from the normal bar diagram right but from a box and whisker if you see in a normal distribution the mean and median should be one right so here this is the median if, if it is a normal distribution it should happen in the center because the arithmetic mean will be in the center right so so here the mean is different median is different so if you see the interquartile ranges are different so uh, this is a non normal distribution now how to put each patient again this indicates the individual patient in the whole so this is the entire range of the data and then how to do distribution how to add distribution here what will you do for that so this is box and whisker so these are the boxes these are the whisker these are the jitters which will tell you the individual patient data so what is this violin plot right so so here if you if you see carefully the inside box and whiskers are the same right but to do the distribution we can construct a violin outside so if you see here uh, for example this this uh, what do you call it? this is maximum here so the maximum number of patients are here that is why if you draw a box and whisker plot the peak will be here and as you go i was telling you as you go away from the mean the number of patients will come down right that is the dispersion so here also if you go up the number of patients will keep on coming down now a perfect box and whisker plot would be something like this right where you see only one bulge right but if you see here there are two bulges this is like a guitar uh, but we don't call it a guitar plot we still call it a box and i mean violin plot but here the distribution is uh, non normal it's not a normal distribution because you have two peaks this is the perfect normal distribution right uh, so so that is uh, so the best way to present numerical data or comparison between two groups is box and whisker plot or a violin plot right now the thing is how to generate all this many of this looks very attractive and how to generate now right so that is what the next few classes will be uh, they will be showing you how to think so the best and still all time favorite is our good old ms excel you can create many many beautiful graphs in excel we need to learn little bit of tweaking with some codes and formulas but you can still make many of these things that i showed today some of them may take little time so this is the simplest in the spectrum and in the other spectrum there are things like r studio r studio is a uh, platform actually which has many smaller software ggplot corogram all this corelogram box and whisker plot were generated in our studio python is another one Mat matlab is another very upcoming very powerful tool where you can create this kind of graphics but this needs you to learn some kind of coding at least some some knowledge of coding would be important some conceptual understanding of the basic mathematics which we as clinicians i mean are not fond of so what lies in between is things like spss data jump and there is another online software called flourish some of them you saw were made in flourish and i think um, sri lanka will tell you about how to generate things in flourish 
So that is another, and this is uh, free, you just have to register. There is another thing called Tabli, which is equally good, but you have to register and it's a paid registration. But Paris is kind of a free registration to a certain extent. And that's how you can generate all these things. So I think I'll stop here and the next subsequent classes will be on how to generate this. And I'll, I'll share a database. You can bring your computers and download the software and you can actually practice on site. Thank you. So any questions, suggestions? No questions, no suggestions and comments. Okay. Okay, then I think it was either very bad or very good. <laughs> no one either didn't understand anything or understood everything, right? Whatever it is. So anyway, thank you. We can stop.